Hello, members of Faith Lutheran. Uh, we are unable to meet for Bible study this evening, uh, Thursday, October 15th. And so I wanted to record the session for all of you to take advantage of uh, watching this video and to stay current with the Bible study. We're studying the book of Colossians with the theme, The Supreme Christ Equips Christians. We uh, went through an introduction to the letter two weeks ago, and then last week we, we started it, the first 14 verses. I wanted to do a little recap quickly uh, of what we went through last week at the beginning of Paul's letter. Uh, every week we're going to be looking at these two points, the, the theme of the study, how is Jesus supreme and how are we equipped? And so according to the first 14 verses, uh, we saw that the, the gospel was bearing fruit among the Colossian believers, uh, and we noted how the gospel still bears fruit to this day. Uh, and Jesus is supreme in the sense that it, it's his church, it always is. Uh, and the way in which history unfolds, the directions in which uh, the church goes, in which all of life goes, history is his story. Uh, Jesus is supreme over our entire world. And how are we equipped? Uh, that was really a, a long list from the very opening of Paul's letter. Uh, we looked at how he prays for his fellow believers and how we too pray for each other. How faith and love spring from the hope that we have stored up for us in heaven. Uh, that the, the simple fact that there are fellow believers throughout the world. Um, we are not alone in our Christian faith. Uh, never. Pastors and teachers who teach us God's word uh, still happening to this day equipping each of us for instruction in our faith, knowledge of God's will, wisdom, and understanding, which then lead to the next point, uh, providing us with power for endurance, patience, joy, and thanks. Uh, the fact that we are already qualified for God's inheritance and kingdom, and that we are already rescued and redeemed by our Savior. Uh, a really tremendous list of how we are equipped as believers in Christ from our supreme Lord Jesus. Uh, this is how the last section left off, verses 13 and 14, we're told, For he, that is Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so now we dive into the next part of chapter 1, verses 15 to 29, which begin. The Son, again, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Clearly, Paul just launches into these lofty words of praise to Jesus. And we're going to take a look at a handful of uh, particular words and phrases. Uh, the image of the invisible God. What comes to your mind when you hear a phrase like that? Perhaps not one we've thought of before. Uh, you think of all the times in the Old Testament that God appeared to his people. And it was always connected with some sort of, of cowering or hiding of their face because of the radiance of God's holiness. Uh, as if God is unable to be seen or unable to be known. I want to ask you this question. Have you ever heard of someone who calls themselves an agnostic? That's a, a sort of a fancy way of just simply saying they don't know whether or not there is a God. If there is a God, he can't be known. That it, it would be impossible for human beings to know who God is, even if there is a God in the first place. But what does God's word tell us? John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, or God the only begotten, which is the Son of God, Jesus, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus himself said in John 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So contrary to what anyone might uh, think or speculate or wonder about whether or not there is a God and if we can know him, uh, because God is gracious and merciful to us, we can know him. He has made that possible for us to know who he is and what he is like. And, and we see all of it through Jesus. That's what Paul means when he says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. He is what we need to know. 
about who God is. Another statement in these first verses that calling Jesus the firstborn over all creation. It's kind of an interesting title. Uh, and it, it might make you think uh, uh, firstborn as if uh, the Son of God was, was created, as if uh, he, there was a time when he wasn't. And that is not the case. Um, the Son of God is eternal, just like God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. There's never a time when he wasn't. So calling Jesus the firstborn over all creation serves a different purpose. It's more of a, a rank in comparison to creation. Jesus is superior to all of creation. To all created things, he's superior because he created it all. Uh, I always love it when uh, my daughter Evelyn asks questions like, uh, is Jesus strong enough to lift, uh, lift an elephant? And I always love to tell her, well, he created the elephant. Uh, so not only is he uh, st strong enough, but superior over everything that's ever been created, because he created it. Uh, so again, Paul is clearly uh, going on this, uh, this great uh, line of how Jesus is superior to all things. Uh, and, and you think about why he's saying this to the Colossians. Clearly there were people within that church, uh, false teachers, who are trying to diminish Jesus, putting him on the same plane as anything created. Uh, and Paul is going out of his way to emphasize that he is far above everything. Um, the last phrase of this section, and in him all things hold together. I find it uh, interesting how the greatest minds in the world, astrophysicists and scientists in every department, um, they, they work so diligently to understand what makes up our universe, what uh, continues to drive the universe forward, what holds it all together. Uh, works uh, like Stephen Hawking, uh, his theory of everything, uh, his writings on the grand design of all creation. Of course, he looks at all of it with, with no, uh, no insight whatsoever into God or who he is or what he does. So what the greatest minds are, are investigating and analyzing uh, they're looking at the work of Christ and yet not seeing him. Paul simply says, in him all things hold together. Uh, all of the workings of our universe, down to the, the smallest details, to the, the most obvious things we see. In him, in Jesus, all things hold together. That's a, just a mind-boggling statement. All things have been created through him and for him. Paul in Acts chapter 17 said, In him we live and move and have our being. Uh, and so sort of the first point that Paul is making in these early verses is that Christ is supreme over all creation. All created things uh, are, are created by him and for him. The next verse is 18 to 20, and he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in him he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Uh, the head of the body. The New Testament, especially Paul's writings, makes use uh, of this phrase, you know, the body of Christ. Here are a couple examples. Romans 12.5 says, In Christ we, though we are many, form one body, each member belonging to all the others. 1 Corinthians 12 says, You are a part of the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5, There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, so the New Testament uh, clearly, especially again, Paul clearly connects us to Christ. We are his body on earth, all believers, the church. And while those passages just, just read are, are focusing more on our involvement in that body, here in Colossians 1, verse 18, Paul is making the, the connection that Jesus is the head of that body. Uh, and you think about the significant role the head plays in the body, uh, the mind, the direction, the brain. Without the head, the body is dead. 
Uh, Paul is giving Jesus that supreme position in the church, that supreme position for all believers, the head. And again, he uses the word firstborn, calling Jesus the firstborn, this time firstborn from the dead. And what bring what does that bring to your mind, uh, that phrase in connection with the firstborn from the dead? Uh, how about a, a really nice Easter connection? Jesus' resurrection. He was the first to go from death to life, and through faith in him, so do we. As the head goes, so the body. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, meaning there are many more to come. Us. Uh, And then in 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So again, kind of pointing towards the false teaching going on amongst the Colossians. uh, If there was any... Uh, thought about making Jesus less than God or less than uh, someone worthy of our faith and following, uh, Paul puts that uh, doubt to rest. All the fullness of God dwells in Christ. So this section here, uh, talking about what Jesus has done for sinners, uh, means that he is supreme over the church, over believers. So now we see a a, a dual aspect here. Christ is supreme over creation and over the church. It's sort of sad to think about those two things, knowing that unbelievers don't know either of those things. Uh, They look at the world and the things that we are all enduring, the difficulties, the struggles that never end, and they don't see anyone who is lovingly supreme over all of it. And then they don't know the way in which he has also uh, given them the gift of salvation. Believers know both of these things. And it shapes every aspect of our life. Uh, What a rich blessing to to know both of these. And then to look at uh, the people of this world, uh, seeing exactly what it is they're lacking, and knowing that that's what we have for them. Christ is supreme. Uh, these first uh, few verses, 15 to 20, can uh, are often called the, the Christ hymn. Uh, these words of Paul just sound like such a lofty hymn of the most amazing praise. And in fact, as you were listening to those words, maybe you heard some echoes of hymns that we sing in church uh, from our hymnal. Uh, it seems like many of these hymns, and this is just a short list, uh, would have been taken from this text in Colossians, hymns like, 125, when I survey the wondrous cross. 344, at the name of Jesus. 345, in the cross of Christ I glory. 370, all hail the power of Jesus' name. 376, Jesus, your blood and righteousness. 399, to God be the glory. That's an old classic. Um, And I think that one, you can really see the connection to this text. 538, the church is one foundation. We just sang that in worship not too long ago. Uh, And, of course, the great 752 in the supplement, uh, In Christ Alone. Just a tremendous hymn of of just lofty praise to our Savior Jesus. Continuing on, verse 21, Paul says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, and free from accusation. Imagine sharing this good news with an unbeliever. And just think of the power in the way that Paul says it. The power of the word already. Uh, That word's not in this text, but in 22, Paul says, but now. And the point is that what Jesus has done is a completed fact. When we share the gospel, when we share our faith, we, we may have these thoughts of how we, we have to try to convince them or we have to try to break down whatever barriers they might have. But, but it gets to be simpler than that. We're simply sharing a completed fact. Christ has already forgiven all of your sins. It already happened. It's already finished. And so it's less about the things we have to accomplish in that moment more about simply sharing uh, what it, Christ has already done. Uh, look at it this way. Once you were alienated, once you were enemies, but now you're not. Already forgiven. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. 
this uh, adds great, great depths and strength and confidence to our witness, to our work of evangelism. Paul goes on, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul now is talking to believers, talking about our endurance in our faith. And he begins with the word if, and I know that that's a kind of a troubling word to us sometimes. It sounds like such a condition, and I thought that the gospel was God's unconditional love. So how, how do we understand the word if here? Paul is not uh, putting a condition or putting doubt on God's completed work of salvation. God's love for us and his mercy for us is never conditional. It never changes. It, it, it never, uh, it's never for us one day, but, but not for us another. It's always for us. So that's not what is conditional. What's conditional is the fact that our faith and our loyalty to him is always under attack. We are the ones uh, stumbling, tripping, and falling. Uh, and so what, this if here is, is, a, is an encouragement uh, to continue in our faith, to, to continue to be established and firm in it, not moving from the hope held out to us. Uh, we are the ones constantly in need of, uh, of strengthening and reminding uh, and continuing. Uh, so it isn't God's love that is conditional, uh, but it is encouragement for us to remain in it, to go back to it. It's always there for us. Paul says, this is the gospel that you have heard. Again, he's referring to the truth of the gospel, not the false watering down of the gospel going on among the Colossian believers. We're going to get more into the details of this false teaching next week. Right now, uh, as well as in the beginning, Paul just continues to reference it by phrases like this. The gospel that you have heard passed down from the apostles, passed down from Christ himself. 24 and 25. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my body what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. First off, what is Paul suffering here? What is he referring to? If you remember where he is writing this letter in the city of Rome, he had wanted to go to the city of Rome in order to conduct uh, all kinds of missionary work that would span uh, hundreds and thousands of miles from the city of Rome beyond. Rather, Paul is in Rome now as a prisoner. Uh, he is on house arrest, so he's not locked up in a dungeon, but he is unable to move around freely uh, as he would have liked. Now people have to come to him. And so this is what he refers to as, as suffering. Uh, and then he says, in reference to his suffering, kind of a strange statement. That really uh, makes us think, and, and we do well to think about it. Uh, what does it mean that Paul fills up in his flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions? It sounds like uh, he's saying that Christ's suffering on our behalf isn't finished, uh, and therefore that would mean that salvation isn't finished. And that, of course, is not what he means. Rather, what Paul is saying is that our suffering as followers of Christ, not conforming to the pattern of this world, that is what is far from over. Uh, to be faithful to Christ in this life and in this world means that we, uh, we don't engage or take advantage of all the, the luxuries life has to offer to us. Um, Jesus himself said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. So to be a Christ follower uh, absolutely means that uh, this life will, will be full of, of difficulty and suffering. And it isn't finished. It's not finished uh, until we see him face to face in heaven. So that's what Paul means uh, by what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. It's, it's the afflictions of his body, us, you and me here on earth as his followers. The last part of verse 25, uh, 
I have become a servant by the commission of God, uh, who gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Again, uh, another reference to the fact that what they're being tempted with in false teaching is, is not the fullness of that good news. 26 and 27, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Paul's referring to the gospel here, and another way to refer to it, he calls it the mystery. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, referring to the gospel as a mystery, again, makes us, makes us think. What, why is he using that word, and, and how is he using that word? Um, he's not uh, referring to uh, an Agatha Christie mystery novel or uh, the Hardy Boys or Scooby-Doo. Not that kind of a mystery that needs to be solved. Rather, the, the word here simply means uh, something that was unknown to us, that could not be known by us. We would not have known uh, the good news of, of who Jesus is and what he has done for us unless God revealed it to us in his word. The gospel itself is that mystery, that God is holy, therefore he must punish all sin. He must. And then he's the one who takes the punishment in our place. We would never have known that, that God would do that for us unless it was revealed to us. That's how we can call the gospel the mystery that has been kept hidden but now disclosed to us. And he, uh, he reiterates another way of saying that mystery in the, at the end of that verse 27, Christ in you. And just think about it this way. God would make his home within a sinner like me? Absolutely he would. Uh, what an unbelievable thing that is that God now, uh, through faith in Jesus, faith given to us by the Holy Spirit, that, that Christ has made his home in us. And, uh, and, and by living in us, Paul says, we have the hope of eternal glory to come. Uh, the last two verses now, 28 and 29. He, again, this is Jesus, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Fully mature. Uh, when does that day come? <laughs> uh, we could certainly think that, that that is heaven, and it is. Uh, we will be fully mature then. But I want you to know, too, that it's also right now. Uh, we always have this dual reality as believers in Christ. This dual reality that, yes, there are all kinds of ways in which we are less than mature. All kinds of ways in which we still stumble and fall and things we do not know. Uh, in that way, we could be, be called immature. But yet trusting in Christ, simply believing in what he has done for us, that's maturity. That's how a, a very young child, my daughter, is mature because she believes in Jesus, even though there's all kinds of things she doesn't know. Uh, and just like an elderly believer, uh, trusting in, uh, in Jesus is fully mature, even if there are all kinds of things they don't know. Uh, but that full maturity, we can also think of that as, as when we see him face to face. And until then, Paul says, I strenuously contend. And when is that happening? Uh, that's this Christian life. That's us putting our faith into action. Our strenuous contending uh, doesn't earn us uh, any greater favor. Uh, no one adds to Christ's salvation by the things that, that they do. But rather, because we have Christ's full salvation already, we strenuously contend for it. To continue to dig deeper into it to continue to be daily reassured by it, uh, all of us in, in, in each of our ways strenuously contend for our faith, day in and day out. Maybe a, a, a personal question for you to consider is, what are some areas of your faith that you're less than mature? Uh, to be able to evaluate that for yourself and to, to think of ways to, to become stronger, to grow in that particular area. Uh, if you do think about that and think about it well, then uh, maybe come knock on my door or give me a call sometime. We can talk about it. Uh, realizing our weaknesses is part of strenuously contending for our faith.
So, uh, two things we always want to focus on in this study. How is Jesus supreme? Well, that's just a, a, a massive, a massive section here. Paul has presented Jesus as supreme above all things. He reveals the invisible God. He's supreme, firstborn over creation. All things are held together by him. He is supreme over his church, the firstborn from the dead, his resurrection and ours. He's the head of the body. Uh, the fullness of God dwells in him, and he reconciled sinners to God. What a list. What an incredible list of Christ's supremacy. And then how are we equipped? Uh, wonderful things here, too. We are no longer alienated enemies. We are free from accusation. We are established and firm. We are called to carry our crosses. We are equipped to carry them. The mystery of the gospel has been revealed to us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we strenuously contend for maturity with Christ working in us. We have been well equipped, brothers and sisters in Christ. I, uh, I pray that we would take both of these things, this view of Christ's supremacy and how he has equipped us with us uh, as we go the rest of the day. Lord's blessings to all of you. Uh, let's close in prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, we, we look to you supreme above all things. Uh, help us to keep that view ahead of us uh, as we look at the difficulties of life, of the fears of the unknown, uh, of all the things out of our control, and yet we see you supreme over it all. Uh, and then we see how you have graciously and mercifully equipped us uh, to, to follow you, to continue to follow you uh, as we, we serve one another uh, in all the places and things you've given us in this life. So bless us in our study of Paul's letter to the Colossians. Uh, may we be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray the Bible study would be a blessing to you. Please let me know if there's anything uh, you would like or need, resources, documents, uh, whatever I can do to help you dig deeper into God's word. I, I want to do it. So I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.